Welcome to HashiConf Digital 2020. Hi, my name is Evan Phoenix, and today we're going to be taking an in-depth look at Waypoint and how it works. Even if you're just coming from the keynote, let's do a quick review of what Waypoint looks like from the outside. Here we've got some output from running Waypoint up, deploying a simple app to Kubernetes. Up is composed of three separate phases, a build, deploy, and release phases. It's all configured with a simple configuration file. Again, with build, deploy, and release. Simply put, it helps take your application code and deploy it to a number of different platforms. The aim of Waypoint is to create a common workflow from integrating all of these various components. Today in the deep dive, we're gonna be looking at four separate items, configuration language, client and server architecture, the waypoint entry point, and the plugin architecture. Let's start with the configuration language. It's HEL, as you might expect, which also means it supports JSON. It's project-based, which means that there can be multiple applications specified within one actual project file. And because it's HCL, it has the ability to run functions inside the actual configuration, which adds significant power to the configuration language. Let's take a look at those functions more in depth. So here we've got that same configuration file we looked at earlier, but we're just gonna focus on build. Let's get rid of the other pieces for a second. So one thing you'll notice here is that we've forgotten to configure which Docker tag to use. We've just specified the image. Now many deployment environments use get references for tags, and we can do the same with just a simple function call right here. The waypoint configuration file provides this top level view of your project. It's showing how the application is put together from where the assets are stored, what, what platform it's deployed to, and what strategy it's used to release individual deployments. It's this common interface that no matter which platform you're deploying to, uh, it, it's gonna look the same. If you're deploying to Kubernetes or Nomad, you're gonna, it's gonna look exactly the same inside this configuration file, minus some differences for the individual platform. And also uniquely, as we mentioned earlier, is it has the ability to support multiple applications inside one of these project files that extends the workflow to multiple applications simultaneously if you need. Let's have a quick look at what that looks like. So here we've got that same application as before. Now let's bring in another application to see that, that's gonna be handling the login for this app. So this would be in that same file just below it. And you can see all we've done is just specify yet another application here. This, they're using different deployment targets, and you can see that they just work together. So now that we've, now you can see this project more clearly, you can see that you have to deploy it together and it's gonna span those multiple platforms. Let's switch and talk about the client server architecture. So this is the waypoint architecture that you're gonna, as you're gonna experience today. You've got the client, which has a runner inside of it, the server and your deployment platforms, and the developer. Don't forget him. Now let's break it down into the individual pieces. The server is the part, it basically, you treat it like a catalog. It will track all of the deployments, the artifacts, the releases, and provides what we call providence for all of, the, of what's going on. You can always come back and ask the server, hey, when was this particular Git SHA deployed? Did it deploy last night or this morning? The server is the thing that can answer that question for you. And it provides instance fun functionality, which we're gonna talk a lot about later when we get into the entry point. And lastly, it also provides a UI. So you can go to that, the server and the server will provide you with a nice browser UI for you to interact with it to find out what's going on. on Switching to the client, the client and the server talk via a standard gRPC interface. So the CLI is built with public APIs that anybody can build a client to basically talk to the server. In fact, the UI itself is just a gRPC client that talks to it. And most importantly, the client is actually queuing jobs. So what's important here is that the client is interacting with the APIs and when it wants to do some big action, like for instance, cause a build to happen, it actually asks the server to do, to do that action via a queue. And so in that way, the clients can actually be very thin. They don't have to be something that's gonna be running all the work. They're able to say, hey, I need to go have a build happen and that can happen somewhere else. Where exactly that happens is actually inside the runner. So these runners are driven by the server. They're taking those jobs off of the queue that is created by the client. And that allows this 
very flexible architecture. They're also context aware, right? So a runner is running in some location that can be pre-configured with security credentials and in a specific place so it can access stuff that maybe you couldn't access normally. It's also automatic. So when you're first getting started with Waypoint, setting up a runner can be sort of cumbersome. So what we've done is have the CLI register itself as a runner to the server so that when the CLI says, hey, I want to do a build, the server will hand that CLI back its own job saying, yeah, you can go ahead and do the build on your own. Let's take a look at that Waypoint entry point, which we talked a little about, about earlier with uh, some runtime functionality the server unlocks. The entry point runs inside, the ser runs inside your deployments. So it's a process that's running alongside your application. And it connects back to the server using the config deployment configuration about the address and the credentials to connect back to the server. And then it actually executes your application on your behalf. So in that way, it actually has the ability to sit in front of your application to provide things like log management, which we're going to talk about here in a sec, configuration, uh, as well as just general monitoring. Now, it's also obviously in the production flow. So security is going to be important for a component like this. So let's talk a little bit about that. Because the entry point is, sits within your application, we knew that security was really important for it. So the entry point only makes outbound connections. It doesn't listen on any ports. It's not a vector for being able to access your app. It also doesn't sit within the release URL path. So your app binds to a port, and the load balancer connects to that port to send it traffic. The entry point isn't involved in that, that connection flow. So you don't have to worry about it dropping packets or requests in any way. It also uses a capability-based token system to manage access to the server. So the server, it only has access to the APIs that are specific to the entry point. It doesn't have access to anything else. So it can't, for instance, look at the server list or look at anything else related to uh, any other APIs that the server has other than just what is needed for the entry point. But as with all things security-related, you don't have to take my word for it. The entry point is fully open source. You can go in and inspect it, find out what's going on on it, and find out if you want to trust it or not. It's also optional. If you want to use Waypoint without the entry point, you can go right ahead and do that. You'll miss out on some runtime functionality, but Waypoint will work just fine without it. Let's take a, a closer look at what the entry point looks like inside a Docker image really fast. So here we just got a simple Docker image. You've got the entry point that's launched your application, and the entry point is talking to the Waypoint server, and your app is talking out to the internet. So the, your app isn't talking through the entry point to the internet. Let's talk about another really great feature of the entry point, which is automatic URLs. Uh, are, these are implemented with a service that we call the Waypoint URL service. So when we were building Waypoint, we felt like it was important for all applications, no matter where, what their deployment platform was, to be able to have deployment-specific URLs. This allows for a lot of workflows around verification of deployment before releasing, around just testing applications, around developers being able to push something out and test it and look at it without it having to actually push it out to production. And the way that we've achieved this is with the, the Waypoint URL service. As you use it today, it's entirely powered by HashiCorp. We run it on your behalf. Uh, so you can go ahead and use it out, out there today as you're running Waypoint. And setting, accessing this service is entirely automatic. The first time you install the server, it will talk to the, the URL service. It'll get access to it. You'll be able to use it just automatic. It does have a few limitations. Right now, it's HTTP only. Other protocols, such as raw TCP, will come in the future. It also only supports HTTPS on the ingress. We have some limits on it to prevent abuse. So there's per request and bandwidth limits in effect. That being said, it is fully open source. So if you want a version that doesn't have any of these limitations, you're able to go out and download the source for the URL service, run it yourself, and have your Waypoint entry points connect to your own URL service. And then you can kind of do whatever you want with it in that way. So how do you use and see these automatic URLs? Well, we've actually already seen them. We saw it over here on this, when we saw this before, it was right here at the bottom, right? The host, that host name was auto-generated by the service because one wasn't requested. And that dash dash v1 indicates that this is actually the first deployment for that application. If we were to do another deployment, we'd see that it's v2 and so on. And in that way, you can access previous deployments that are still running. Let's switch to look at another feature of the entry point. Waypoint Exec provides live 
uh, a live debugging environment inside an application that's currently running. And it runs in that same context as that application. So you can do one-off tasks like run database migrations, look at asset files maybe, check to make sure that everything is working correctly. And all that is secured through the server. So the server is managing all those exec requests and to make sure that they're coming from the right uh, clients. Let's have a quick look at the flow around running a command. So in this case, we're just gonna run a simple date command inside our application. So the client says, waypoint exec date, that gets sent as an RPC request to the server, which in turn sends an RPC request onto the waypoint client. Now remember that that connection between the server and the entry point is actually via a connection where the entry point made a connection back to the server. So while we're showing that coming from the server to the entry point, it's not a new TCP connection that's over something that already exists. Then the entry point runs the date command, just outputs the one line, and, out, and sends that output back through the server and then back to the client. And then when it closes again, it sends all that back through. So the entry point or the client sees just a simple output as it came from the application. Let's switch, switch and look at another feature of the entry point called application config. This is a simple feature, but is really powerful. As you are configuring your application, you can run waypoint config set, and that will actually set variables, and those are all stored on the server. And those variables are also per server as well as per project. So maybe you have uh, a project that uses two, apl two applications. Maybe they share an S3 bucket to be able to access assets. You can configure that S3 bucket information at the project level, and then it's shared down to all the projects. And all this configuration, all these configuration variables are provided as environment variables. So it's really easy for the applications to get access to them. Waypoint logs is another great feature of the entry point. The logs are stored on the server in a rolling window of really just the latest logs. And this is a really a developer focused feature. It's optimized for trying to help developers understand what is actually going on in their application right now. It's a live view of what is happening. It's not really meant to provide long-term log storage for your application. That being said, it's compatible with other loggers. So as the entry point gets the logs, gets output from your application and logs them, it also provides that log output on its own output. So it can easily be read and used by other tools and other log capturing um, infrastructure. Let's look a little deeper at what that log flow would look like. This looks sort of similar to Waypoint Exec because it really is. In this particular case, the application has already started up and it's connected previously to the server. And the client has said, hey, I would like to get some logs. As soon as the, the application starts to log things, you can see that it sends that log output up to the server. And the server sees that there's a currently connected client that's interested in logs and it sends them directly on. You can see that it continues on with all future requests. So in that way, you've got the logs streaming nicely from the application all the way up to the client through the server. So wrapping up the entry point, we see that it extends this workflow of building, releasing, building, deploying, and releasing to the runtime. And that's great because it allows developers to really get in the flow of their application. So as they're, once it's in production, they're able to figure out what's going on and then edit it and then go back to the beginning to build, deploy, and release again. These features are really focused on, on those developers, on that day-to-day -day experience of what it is like to be a developer on an application. And it's still compatible with other solutions. So we made sure that it wasn't going to block or, or do something strange so that other services couldn't access that same data. So you can easily use Waypoint, the entry point, as well as a whole bunch of other tools that maybe also do logs or also do exec without stepping on each other's toes. Let's switch and talk about the plugin architecture a little bit. So this is the same configuration file we saw before. And really, we can think of this configuration file as a set of plugins that are actually communicating with each other. The pack plugin is talking to the Docker plugin for registry access, which in turn is talking to the Kubernetes plugin for deployment, which in turn is talking to the Kubernetes plugin again for release. And there's actually values that are flowing through between all those plugins. But first, before we get into the values, let's talk about the actual component types for a second. So that first type is a builder, right? It's access to the application code. The idea here is it's going to take your application and it's going to convert it into some kind of artifact that can actually be used by your deployment system. 
Now, in 0.1, as you're experiencing today, most of our, our most of our builders are generating some kind of Docker image. Those are mostly, as you can see in the examples here, pack as well as the, just a regular Docker um, Docker image builder. The registry is an optional component, and the idea here is that it will ship an artifact to a, a location that can be used by your deployment platform. Now, it's decoupled from build because there can be a lot of different ways of actually achieving getting an artifact from a local machine or a build machine into an actual external wherever you might want to put it. And it captures all that complexity by having it be as a separate plugin. So an example here we have a Docker image, but another good example that is not included on here is actually AWS Elastic Container Registry, which is a separate plugin that automatically authenticates with AWS to send the, the image up there. Platform is probably the biggest plugin type because it's really the one that people will associate most with Waypoint because it's really the thing that's talking to your deployment platform. By default, it deploys the latest artifact given from the previous uh, values that have been passed in. And the idea behind the platform is that it creates these standalone deployments. Without interfering with a previous deployment, the idea is it's trying to set up something that's new and standalone and isn't going to cause an issue. Now, the examples of this are pretty clear. Kubernetes, AWS ECS, Google Cloud Run. Lastly, we have our release plugin type. And this one is also optional. And the idea behind the release plugin type is that it's going to take one of those many deployments that were created previously, and it's going to figure out which one is actually the one to show right now. So if you've got an application, you've got some URL, you can only show one deployment at a time. It's the release plugin that helps you figure out which of those deployments you actually want to be showing at this particular moment. One nice thing is it's also reversible. So if you do, do a deployment and you release a deployment and you realize, oh, no, we forgot an asset or it's broken for some reason, you can just tell the release to go back to the previous deployment and it will do all the work to basically roll you back to that currently running deployment. Again, the examples here are pretty easy. Kubernetes using Kubernetes services and AWS ALB basically configuring the ALB to point to various groups, target groups. And today we've got this set of actual plugins. So let's take a quick look at what it's like to actually build a plugin. So it uses Go plugin, just like all the other HashiCorp tools. We provide a simple Go SDK that gives you all of the functionality to actually build one of those plugins. And it includes a rich UI of UI components that you can use to actually display information to the user, such as animated spinners, terminal output, tables, all that kinds of things. Now let's take a little, let's take a quick look at what it looks like for plugins to actually communicate with each other. I think that's an important part of what way, makes Waypoint interesting. Here's some pseudocode showing the four components that we use in the example configuration that we've been seeing so far. We can see a pack builder here that's outputting an actual pack image. And that's getting sent that down to the registry plugin that's taking the pack image in and outputting a Docker image. And the next one of taking a Docker image into the deployment and outputting a, a Kubernetes release. And lastly, taking a Kubernetes release and actually releasing it. So looking at that earlier slide with the types now, we can see those actual types flowing between components from pack to Docker, from Docker to Kubernetes, and from Kubernetes onto Kubernetes again. So the plugins are implementing specific types. They're outputting those specific types. And those specific types allow the system plugins to be implemented much more simply. Because without them, we'd have to do some sort of common denominator data view that have to be passed between all the different component layers. And that would really vastly complicate the components and really not provide any actual benefit. But with all of that rigidity, there are some issues. It lacks flexibility, and that's why Waypoint includes the concept of mappers. Now let's have a quick look to explain mappers. Let's look at what they look like in the real world. So we're back at this slide that we had before. Now let's make some changes to make it look like what it actually looks like today. So instead of having the registry take a pack image and output a Docker image, we're going to change to actually take what it really takes, which is a Docker image and a Docker image, which would be a local reference and output another Docker image, which would be some reference in an actual registry. But see, now we have a problem. The build plugin is outputting a pack image type, but the registry is taking a Docker image type. So this would not be compatible. You just have an error saying that the registry couldn't take in the output from the previous step. And so that's where mappers get introduced. 
a mapper effectively slides itself right in between those two. In this case, it, this is an image mapper that takes a pack image and outputs a Docker image. Now we have eliminated that mismatch between the two by having a mapper basically change from one type to another. Now let's look at the same diagram as before, but now with the mapper. So now we've got PAC talking to the mapper and the mapper changing so that it can talk to back to the registry and then on to Kubernetes. So mappers add a lot of flexibility. If a set of components requires a mapper, as our previous one did, Waypoint automatically detects that and injects the mapper as needed. You could do real almost anything with mappers. You could have a mapper that, say, converted a Docker image to an AMI, or really anything that you need to take one type that a, com that a component uses and output and, out and generate the type that another component needs as an input. There can be plugins that are really only mappers, which is great for maintainability. So you can have, say, a bunch of plugins that do one specific thing and have mappers come in, have a plugin that implements a bunch of mappers that give those existing plugins a whole new life, a whole new set of functionality. In the future, you'll even be able to declare mappers inside your actual waypoint file to be able to do things like say, hey, I want a mapper in this particular way that does a security scan against my Docker image before it gets passed on to the next phase. So let's wrap it up. As we've seen, Waypoint unlocks a common workflow in four specific ways. The first way is that it gives you a configuration file that unifies the description of your application, basically no matter what you're actually deploying to. The architecture of the client server runner model gives you a lot of flexibility in how you actually deploy Waypoint into your, run, your team's needs. Three, those runtime services give you a great set of tools that you can use day to day for the developers. And it really helps extend the workflow from ending maybe at deployment or release phase into the actual runtime phase to help you figure out what changes need to be made. And lastly, the plugin architecture provides a foundation for the components of all types to work together. So as new deployment platforms arise or people build your new all kinds of different things, you can easily plug those into Waypoint and it will continue to work just like it does today. And with that, thank you very much.